So here we are on the very last turn. This is uh, 1785 to 1792. And interestingly enough, the dual French Revolution, 1792 must be sort of the extent of the first revolution. The second one is the indication of the terror and all that. Um, I'm not sure of my numbers there. That feels a little wrong, but okay, it's not by much. Uh, anyway, didn't happen. So what we're assuming here is that the French Federalist Republic or whatever is more or less formed or perhaps some sort of uh, uh, constitutional monarchy. Given that we have a monarch, I would say we still have the constitutional monarchy in place, but whichever way you want to take it. We got a new French ruler. Actually, it was pretty decent, if I recall correctly. Yeah, nine admin. Very promising. But other events that showed up here. Okay, Spain got an offer of royal marriage with Cologne. And someone else got, uh, I think it was Russia, got the dynastic inheritance, um, which I have some words about. So the royal marriage meant that a random minor might drop into the royal marriage box. That's kind of a cool little event, but it doesn't do much. It just gives you a slight bonus on the diplomacy on that uh, minor. So, and, and a possible, dow uh, well, a definite dowry one way or the other but possibly to your advantage. But the dynastic inheritance one isn't too impressive. You pick a country which can be vassalized, that's in your track already, uh, the closest one to your national borders, and you get a bonus on diplomacy of just like plus five or something like that. And if it succeeds, it's just a vassal. I would love to see that event replaced, and I, I, I would consider this, I, I, I'm curious, I doubt that EU 8, 9, whatever, uh, actually plays with that. But I, I, I would consider as very, very pleasing to add that kind of event to somehow spark some of the big dynastic uh, inheritances and crises which happen throughout the historical period. And that's actually how I would want to devise the game. I would want to build it around these random events where uh, associations with miners on your track give you a chance to actually inherit the country and, and, and maybe be a personal union like uh, Scotland. And, and I think you kind of see that in the computer game eventually, but it, not in the original version. But that's the kind of thing that I'd like to see, a more generic, uh, less based on these real events, and more based on, okay, we can judge this is what happened here because of this and try to devise all that. Yeah, it would be a, a nightmarish job. But then again, putting this thing together must have been just such a tremendous job anyway. And I, I don't think that we're talking something on a smaller scale, uh, on a larger scale. Certainly you can do a smaller scale uh, generalization. I've seen things like that. Good old... Uh, Empires of the Middle Ages there is an example of that very light. Uh, but to get something with this level of detail, yet with that generosity, not generosity, uh, <laughs> would be very pleasing uh, to me at least, where maybe there are a, a lot more events, etc., to handle in terms of being very... Uh, you know, it would be hard, harder to, to uh, get everything nailed down right, is my worry. But you wouldn't have to worry quite as much about the historical research in terms of um, specific events and tying specific leaders. So that's the game I would like to see here. And if I were capable of designing a game and, and, and focusing my energy like that, that's what I would have done. I would have taken this and probably beyond, you know, uh, the 200 years. Of course, I, I would fail no matter what. But <laughs> that, that's, that's what I'd like to capture. Something that captures the historical currents and, 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 and presents this sort of view of what history's main um, 
waves are, as it were, uh, and, and, and tries to represent those and then see how much that actually creates something that's believable in terms of the story. That's just me babbling, of course. Uh, Austria, they got a minor advantage. Um, from the events, though, we got a couple of destabilization. Well, let's go to the, the uh, with the political events. The first one that came up was the Mamluks. Now, they break free and become <coughs> a vassal of Turkey's. But you don't see them over here. And that's because there were two destabilization events. And that drove them completely out. Now, Turkey has a free Cassis Bell, uh, I believe a free Cassis Belli against the Mamluks. But it's in no position to take that. If they had been able to get a piece, they would ha uh, probably want to take advantage of it. What they have to do to win it is conquer everything in the Mamluks. There's not enough time. And that's one of the problems with this. This event's going to come out in the last period. Chances are not are good that it's going to come out, you know, in the last four turns or so. Well, there's not a lot of time to get that grand conquest of those territories. So now those are all lost. If they were in vassal, it wouldn't be a big deal. In fact, I looked at that and said, well, I'm not going to declare war on them when they're in vassal. But they immediately broke free due to the destabilization. And now... And that's because the Mamluks have a tremendously low, like the Persians do, an eight, I think, um, number, a target number. So even moderate rolls are going to uh, disassociate them. So now Turkey's without that, and that's a lot more victory points off, and Spain's saying, Whew, I think I got him. I think I got fifth place in this game. Rah! Russia beat me. Oops. Never seen that happen before. I've got to say, it's got to be the Risto events, but I'm not quite sure how to point to it. I think the times of trouble were a lot less painful than in prior games that I've seen. I've seen those just drag on creating a mess and I think that's got to be something to do with the rules maybe also with my misreading of the original rules okay well I don't know what's going to happen in the diplomacy but I don't think it's going to be a lot uh, I don't see England for example jumping into a war with France I don't think they can gain anything their hope here is France and Austria wreck each other and maybe England comes out first or second um, They've got their own problem to deal with, right? Uh, anyone else? Russia has an interest in the Crimea. If they can grab that, that's a big bonus for them. So they're going to probably go for that. Their other option, of course, is Poland. Uh, but there's not a lot to gain on the Polish side, whereas they've got a real desire for the Crimea, um, if I recall correctly from their victory points. France and Austria and Turkey are all tied up and don't want to go anywhere. What about Spain? Well, Spain kind of feels like there's just nothing they can do. They could throw themselves in against Turkey, but that means France would possibly declare war on them. And I don't know how much they really want to do that. Also, throwing themselves in at this point would cost them two stability, which probably will cost them more than whatever they will not gain from Turkey, because they're not going to get anything here. So, probably they just want to stay uh, out of this. I don't see a minor that they can knock out real quick. Portugal's always a possibility, but, you know, it's easier not to. All right, onward. So, indeed, Russia declares war on the Crimea, and I'll set them up in a moment. <sighs> and let's see. We had a lot of diplomatic undertakings. First of all, the French ignored the Holy Roman Empire and let the Austrians take that. They get 10 victory points, enough money to play and get some, dip, uh, some alliances going. For the alliances, we saw a lot of competition going. So, for example, France and England both went for Prussia. Austria didn't go for anything. Spain and France went for Bavaria. Anyway. What we ended up seeing in uh, deployment, France got Savoy added to theirs, Spain got Bavaria and Württemberg, and England added Saxony, Denmark, Cologne, and Prussia, and Holland all to their track. Huge, huge turn for them. They're not at war. They could afford to expend on them. They're going for a Protestant alliance at the end of the game. Okay, great. Well, 
you can kind of see the English building this, especially uh, in light of the world, the way it's set up, an anti-French coalition among the miners uh, to try and take on this French beast that seems to be raging throughout. But they're not going to actually fight them within the game. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll play an Empires in Arms game after this just to, you know, use this as the takeoff point. That would be an interesting game, except Poland. Poland's beginning to look like a real country here in a way that, well, I don't know if they fairly can be represented in Empires in Arms. Uh, just in terms of they don't have enough troops in Empires in Arms to be worthwhile as a miner, whereas in this they really do still have enough. Uh, we're not talking about the Duchy of Warsaw here. <laughs> okay. Anyway, this is the situation we're in. We'll throw the uh, economics into play, but basically we've got a war between Austria, France, and Turkey, and one between Russia and the Crimea of some vague importance. And the rest of it even less, the English trying to deal with their issue. One major thing I forgot to mention, I got a big old stack of poles coming in. The French were able to get them to join the war. So they're only in Expeditionary Corps, but that allows them to work quite deep. Uh, I believe it's six movement points into Austria. So they can do some serious damage to the Austrian holdings. Even if they were just in military alliance, they could with how much, you know, Austria is just next to their territory everywhere. <laughs> Running into one of the many problems I'm here in the economic phase with playing a game like this, the end turn is stilted. Uh, for example, the English, I look over things and they, I, I rolled for it and, and went ahead and spent they don't want to build trading posts. They don't want to build colonies. Uh, the only value to that is there is some potential points in having the most of commodity exports, I think. I didn't look too carefully. But uh, only in certain specific cases. And they're not really gaining anything by their upgrades right now. Uh, they spent... 60 bucks on colonies here, that doesn't help them. They wouldn't get any victory points. They did spend a uh, 100 bucks on the two trading post areas. This one didn't matter. This one, well, they got their level. So that's a victory point. But that's a victory point for 100 bucks. They get that anyway, or for 50 bucks. Well, 100 if you pair them up. They'd get that anyway. But I cannot stop myself from trying to, you know, do something with that money of value. I really hate when a game feels like, ah, it's the last turn, I don't care about the next turn, basically. Um, that's just disturbing to me in a lot of ways. And I, I don't know what to do about it, really. Well, things don't look terribly good for the Austrians here. Um, for the production, mainly the military production we're looking at. France, lots more armies here. Just, yeah, just detachments, but... The, Another 50 strength points of troops. One of the reasons is there's a bonus for having the most troops on the board. They also built up their navy. I don't think they beat England because England built theirs up for the same goal. Whoever has the most fleets gets a big 150 points or something. It's 100 points for biggest army or maybe 150. I don't know. It may depend on the countries. It also depends on which of the victory conditions I use. And remember, I'm going to probably uh, score for both. Anyway. Turks built up what they can, but the scary thing, there's a big Polish army, the Crimean, that's really just facing the Russians, uh, grew and they, they dropped another for, uh, another fortification in place, and let's see, the Venice did not get any reinforcements. They didn't get enough to cover what they had. They'd have to demobilize, but Austria was able to cover uh, the extra army plus in terms of costs, so, well, and they don't have a navy, so, <laughs> anyway, we'll be moving into the rounds uh, after I do some competitions that I, of course, forgot about. Hmm. Well, as always, the first round is often very, very important. In this case, I kind of want to highlight in on the very first phase of it, which was the French-Turkish-Polish alliance. Uh, the French pushed into Mantua and largely destroyed 
the Venetian armies, down to a few cav, but they took pretty heavy losses on their own, their armies, uh, and, they, and they don't, they've sucked down all those infantry, there's only like 10 extra infantry left they can pull. They're almost out of infantry there. Over here, the Turks uh, took Thessalonica and uh, a Moldavian troop marched in here, actually swerved around to avoid the river, and broke the siege here in Odessa, uh, driving the Austrians. And they had to go all the way back here because there's Polish sieges all over the territory that the Poles lost. Uh, I guess that's it for that first little segment. Okay, end of the round. Rest of the powers really just fighting against um, their insurrections. The English still have a hard time, mainly because Howe is so bad at that kind of job. He's not a bad general on a military plane. He can fight battles and win, but boy, he can't get rid of those unrests, and that's, uh, you know, kind of adequately handled, I think. The Spaniards also have their issue trying to deal with Sardinia. This should have moved here. Um, and we'll see if they can get rid of that. For the Austrians, they're, well, how about the Russians? The Russians moved down. For the Austrians, mainly uh, to prepare themselves to attack Crimea, they couldn't reach it with all their forces. For the Austrians, mainly what we see is a repositioning of forces. Some of them flying past each other because there's units that can go into these armies, and I'm, uh, I've reinforced the Venetian arm, uh, well, detachment, uh, with a, a Habsburg detachment or Austrian detachment. Primarily, hey, try to prevent one more attack from succeeding, but you know, there's a real limit to how much a couple detachments can do, and that might end up costing more than it's worth if they end up getting destroyed, which is fairly likely. Um, We've got Austrians positioning themselves to face the uh, Poles, as well as consolidating forces for facing the Turks, and then also the march into Moldavia. It's one of the easiest things to get rid of for me, and, and to get some quick points off of, so uh, that's a high priority, but driving the Poles off is also a high priority. There's so many Polish, uh, there's so many vulnerable spaces in the old Polish territory that I've got to defend that. This stuff is going to fall a lot more slowly. But it looks pretty bad for Austria, just in terms of they may actually have to accept a losing peace to get some of their territory back. And talk about an anticlimax. The final turn ends after just two rounds. And no, I'm not cheating there. I mean, I could lie and say, well, yeah, I rolled one. But truth of the matter is, I was kind of looking forward to a little bit more action happening towards the end of the game here. But these turns are just rocking away, and, uh, well, you know, what happens, happens. Uh, I've got some end-of-turn administrative stuff, then I'm going to put a different video for the scoring and the final wrap, and then, of course, the review. Uh, a game of this size with this much effort, I think, deserves a significant amount of talking about beyond what I've done just you know, throughout it all. But we're not going to see much happening. Um, in this turn, French made another movement against uh, Venice and its forces here in Innsbruck didn't get any ground on them. Uh, Turks moved here into Kosovo and failed. And the Austrians managed to drive away a Polish um, army. Right now, well, there's some reason Austria would want a white piece. Essentially, they've lost this territory if they don't take one. So they might be willing to trade on their current fortune, which uh, right now, let's see what we got here. Turkey's at minus two on there. And then another three. Wow, we're looking at a piece of level five, I think, if, uh, if, if, if there was an actual surrender. That's kind of hard to walk away from. But on the other hand, what do you gain otherwise? You lose Macedonia, um, and there's really nothing else 
that the other powers can give you. They can't give you less than the piece you're set at. Of course, after uh, investments in the uh, stability, that may be a little bit less painful of a, of a shift here. Uh, but as it stands right now, it is kind of ugly. Uh, you know, from the Austrian point of view, you kind of say, I deserve more than this. Uh, truth is, though, I think they're going to get a white piece either way. I think they won it because they lost the territory. Uh, the only question, of course, is, hey, maybe I can get something off Poland. Unlikely, but possible. All right. Well, I wanted to highlight in a little bit on the piece step here because this is the last one of the game and other things. Um, the English were unable to contain the revolt and it's beginning to spread into the coastal areas now. So we're kind of seeing a rebirth of that American freedom idea here at the end of the game. Uh, and Spain was unable to cope with it either. I'm not going to withdraw them. Basically, a lot of the stuff that I do at the end of the turn, there's no reason to do on this turn because it's maneuvering troops and such. Not Yes, it could cause a small loss of navies or troops, but it's just not worth the effort. Um, here's where we ended up with the stability track before the peace phase. Now, at this point, the question here is Austria is winning a piece of level three. They would love to get that signed. But Turkey's sitting on some Austrian territory. Poland's sitting on some Austrian territory. Austria's not going to get a piece in their favor. But both France and Turkey would love to get the extra point for a white piece. Now, in this case, France isn't going to get it, and Turkey isn't going to get an advance in their stability unless they give Austria that white piece. France isn't totally thrilled with this, but there's not a lot they can do. Um, to tell you the truth, their worry about the situation, they may be telling Turkey, no, uh, I'm not going to give you the piece, because France is a little worried about uh, Austria's total power and value, and the fact that they're holding a couple of things, France is going to be telling Turkey, you make, you make the peace, and that's all fine, but I'm not going to make it, and you're going to break our alliance and lose a point of stability for that. I think that's what's going to happen. France, uh, Turkey is going to agree to a peace with Austria. France is not, and thus what we see is Turkey boosting up, Austria also boosting up, and then Turkey dropping back down for the broken alliance. And that means the Turks, and they risked their sultan here, he didn't turn out to be a good leader, end up losing this. And that's about it, really. Elsewhere, I don't see anything. The Russians don't terribly have any reason to make peace with the Crimea. And everyone else is in pretty stable state. Oh, not quite. France is down three, and Austria is down three for the continuing of the war. Turkey got themselves freed of that. This is a prosperity penalty uh, for the Turks. Now, here's the thing, though. Austria, I believe, gets the prosperity bonus, so they boost up one. I was just figuring out the end uh, of turn victory points. Uh, I'm going to zip it up here. This is what we're going to see for them. And we haven't seen a lot moving. France got a pile, and England got a pile from all the trading. But that's about all that we're going to see in movement. The big victory points come at the end of the period, and then the end of the game. And I'm going to do that on a separate video. So this one's going up.